and not for periods of time that were necessarily significant. It was really in September 2012 that China decided that, that there was a net change, and now they were sending regularly their Coast Guard vessels in a figure-eight pattern, regularly entering into territorial waters. And then as of December 2012, we saw the introduction of a Chinese maritime surveillance prop plane, and we've seen incursions since then by Chinese aircraft into the Japanese air defense identification zone, which prompts the scrambling of jets by Japan. And so we get into a much more precarious area, whereas already Coast Guards that are patrolling in proximity is very dangerous, but in a way the aerial element makes it even more dangerous. The United States has expressed strong concerns to China after Beijing bolstered its claim to an area of the East China Sea covering islands that are also claimed by Japan. China has said it will take defensive emergency measures against aircraft that fail to identify themselves properly in airspace over the islands. The American Secretary of State John Kerry says he's urged China not to implement its threat to take any such action. Do you think that the Chinese government would risk an incident, particularly if it involved a non-military plane in the area? No, I think that's a very unlikely scenario. Um, I, I think the reasons that people are worried about the area is that if anyone miscalculated, uh, the Japanese side would have to show its, its um, determination and remain strong, also not to lose faith over this declared new zone. But I don't think there's any real risk for, for civilian airplanes. And basically, uh, what's important to know is that it's an air defense identification zone. So it's not air space. It's not the same as territorial space uh, of China. It's basically an attempt to monitor what comes towards a nation state uh, in case of danger. And other countries have similar zones. So this is essentially the Chinese side trying to use the civilian mechanism to uh, unbalance uh, the situation in the East China Sea, or from that perspective, to rebalance it, uh, because Japan already has such a zone over that area, which reaches all the way up to the coastline in China and northern Taiwan. So uh, I basically don't think this is about trying to escalate the situation to the extent that there'd be a conflict. It's more of a symbolic action. I think that China is now grappling with the fact that they've put this announcement out there, and now many countries have blatantly violated it, and so China has to prove to its own internal nationalists that it meant something with this announcement. So obviously, neither Japan nor China want to you know, engage in a full-scale war. The threat here, or the risk here, is that there will be an incident that both sides cannot easily back down from, given the sort of poor state of their bilateral relations, the height of nationalist opinion in both countries, and things like that. Stephanie Klein Albrand from the U.S. Institute of Peace an independent federal institution in Washington, D.C. <coughs> On Rear Vision today, we also heard Dr. Florian Schneider from the Chinese Department of the University of Leiden, Dr. Ian Storey from the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, Ronald Ban Lau from the Philippine Institute for Peace, Violence and Terrorism Research in Manila, and Dr. Li Mingjiang from the Dr. <coughs> Atlam School of International Studies in Singapore. Mark Don is the sound engineer for Rear Vision today. Goodbye from Kerry Phillips. There you go. By coincidence, there you go. Managed to broadcast a fairly up to date description of what was happening probably up until the Chinese Foreign Minister telling Julie Bishop to her face that. Uh, her position has deeply offended the Chinese government and all 1.3 billion of the population. But it makes a nice little follow-up to uh, the first dog on the moon and my post-scriptum rant, which I recorded earlier on the day. Wobbles on a lot of YouTube. Ciao.